what drives me and what probably always have driven me was fear. Then I would get myself into a state where I didn't care if it was Fellaini, for example, pictures of me squaring up to Fellaini. I didn't care how I just lost right. complete control of when I was in, on the back page of a fag, thinking, oh my God, what's Arson going to think? From a mental point of view, probably at that point, I didn't realize how much damage it had done. You could tell straight away when, when Mikel came in, he was, he, he was a leader, he was a little bit different. This is up front with me, Simon Jordan. I believe there are a lot of vacuous, uninformed, unchallenged opinions out there. I want to get to the bottom line and cut through the nonsense. So on this podcast with William Hill, I'm going to get people with strong views who think they can stand them up under proper scrutiny. There's a good chance I might learn something along the way, but more importantly, so might you. Joining me in today's episode, a player who pulled on the famous Arsenal shirt at just 16 years old. He was lauded for his talent, seen as the future for club and country, before injuries took him off course. He saw the final years of Wenger before becoming part of the new era under Mikel Arteta as he begins his coaching career in North London. Jack Wilshire, welcome to Upfront. Thank you for having me. Nice to see you, mate. And you. Um, uh, on these shows, what we try to do is get a little bit of underneath the bonnet and understand certain aspects of people and some of their background and some of their the challenges they've been through. And I'm going to start this one with you with a sort of retrospective view of yourself because obviously your career starts very brightly and you're playing for one of the biggest clubs in English football. You're starting very early. You're playing for your country. But it comes to a conclusion to some extent prematurely. I mean, ultimately at 30 years of age, you're retiring your Arsenal career comes to an end at 26. When you look at your, back on your own career and reflect on your experiences, what's your takeaway? How do you look at it? Um, frustration is the first word that, that comes to my mind. Um, yes, I finished that at 30, which was early mm. as well. But really being honest, probably, like you said, when I left Arsenal, I was... 26, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was on the way certainly on the way down, um, struggled a bit at West Ham um, to find fitness, to find form. And, and you know, at that point, I look back and I thought, oh, I should have stayed at Arsenal, they offered me a deal. Um, but probably mm. what I was holding on to is that support around Arsenal. So okay. the, the physios, the doctor, who I right. really knew well, who really right. understood me. And I lost that when I left Arsenal. And, and that was really sort of the beginning of the end for me. Do you look at it through a sort of prism of what if... I mean, life throws us curveballs, isn't it? And it challenges everybody. Um, and you're probably, and we'll talk about this later on, going to go through a period and probably are going through a period of reinvention mm -hmm. because having to come out of the game so young. But do you look at it as what if? No, I think, of course. I think what if. Um, and that's not all the time. I don't walk around. No, because it's, not, it's yeah, counterproductive. Yeah, though. I don't walk mm -hmm. around day to day thinking like that. But there's, there's moments where I think what if. And I had one today. I just took a training session with, with my team <clears throat> and I joined in. That's under 18s at Arsenal. Yeah, right and now. I joined in and I had a a coach um, watching who who actually brought me to Arsenal, so I brought him back in so he could get a feel for it. And he was like, you, you could still play. And so I had their moments, you know, like when I joined in and training and, I, you know, I'm still fit, I'm still uh, young enough um, where I think, well, I could play. But then I'm sitting here, my ankle's going bang, bang, right. bang. So then you, that's when you really have their moments. Um, yeah, and then you can break that down to, you know, when when I got my first injury, um, what if it was managed a little bit differently or what if I viewed it differently and I wasn't mm. so hungry to come back and just Yeah, I'm going to ask you about that. I'm going to get into the, um, the way that you operated against the way that you played. But I want to take you back. Before we get into that start part of your career, I want to take you back to the beginning because – you, you're nine years of age when you, li you land at Arsenal. So you're going into an academy set up about the same time as I'm buying Crystal Palace. You, you go to Luton first, don't you? Yeah. So how do you get to Arsenal? And was it always Arsenal that you wanted to be at? Um, Your mum no. supports Arsenal, doesn't she? My mum does. Yeah. And I grew up a West Ham fan. Right. Okay. Um, how did I get to Arsenal? So I, I was at Luton. Like I went, it was when, around the time where Luton was a centre of excellence. So they weren't an academy. Right. Uh, been at Cambridge briefly just before that. Okay. Um, and at what age? Eight? Maybe seven. Cause I think I right, went to Luton okay. at eight and stayed there till I was nine. Um, and then it was strange actually how it happened. So we played a game. I played for Luton, played against Barnet. Um, and the ref was actually the scout. Um, and yeah, he, he invited me down. And it was actually like a really tough decision for me. 
believe it or not, like Luton, it wasn't even the academy, it was centre of excellence, but it was 15 minutes from my house. I, it was at that point where academies were introducing, if you played for an academy, you couldn't play for your Sunday league team or your school right. team and stuff like that. Okay. It might have been a little yeah, bit yeah. before that. Yeah, I remember. Uh, but at Luton, I could do that. Right. And so I had that like um, to deal with as well. Uh, and I didn't want to leave my mates. And I remember even Arsenal had to pay for me. I think they paid about £1,500 and there was a deadline. I waited right up to the last day to make that decision. And obviously... It it must was... have been a gear change though, going from yes. Luton to London yeah. Colney, right? Well, it was probably more of a gear change for my parents. Right. Um, more my dad really having to get me up there three times a week from um, from Hitchin, which was could have been an hour, could have been two hours right. some, some days. Um, but yeah, and then in terms of like the detail, the the coaching, mm. it was definitely a gear change. And what were your parents' attitude towards it? Was it something, I mean, did you see, I mean, often when I talk to you guys, being footballers or boxers, it's, sport is often a way out of something. It doesn't appear mm. that that's similar for you. It doesn't appear that in the boxing world, some people are getting away from the disadvantages of life or the challenges that they've had with their parents and whatever else being involved in single parent families or in parents that don't have the financial means to be able to support them and the challenges they want to get away from it doesn't appear that was the case for you so where, what was what, where were your parents motivation for you this did they want you to be a sportsman yeah no they were yeah. they were brilliant and they never stood in my way or never um don't get me wrong like the punishment would be if you don't do that you're not playing football right um but apart from that they they were very supportive what it pushes they weren't really pushers, no. Like, and I look back and I like, was thinking about the question and and like, don't get me wrong, we I didn't grow up poor. Like, no. I didn't grow up poor, but you know, we grew up in a in a council yeah. estate, council house, um, and football was like your only sort An of opportunity. thing on the weekend. Yeah. It was free, you know, you didn't have to yeah. go anywhere, you didn't have to jump in a car, like, I had a park at the bottom of my road. Um and yeah, it was just something that was there and I loved it. I sat here with Michael Owen who talked about and he seemed quite casual about it, that he pretty much instantly knew that he was better than most people around him and instantly knew the direction of travel that he was going in and he was going to be something significant. Was your confidence and was your belief no. like that? Were you cut from that cloth? No. No. Um, I just think back and I remember like going to Arsenal and how, how it worked. Arsenal was like you were almost given two years and then at the end of that two years you were um, assessed analysed and yes another two years or not right and I always remember well, even at the age of nine yeah so you'd have been assessed at 11 yeah right. I always remember actually I think it was 10, 12, 14 14, 16, yeah. 18 yeah, yeah. and I always remember like going into their meetings or that time coming around and just being so nervous like, right not not going into it thinking well yeah I know I'm going to get another deal um, especially when I was young probably when I got to to 14 and then you start you know at four, uh, under 14 I was playing in the under 18s and you sort of still get that you get a feel for it yeah. yeah no you get a feel that okay right. I must be I must on be the way. on yeah. the way yeah. um, and then things just happen really quick time and so I, I went when I went full time uh, my first pre-season was with the first team because of the Euros because mm -hmm. they had no players done really well then I was in the first team dressing room um, but now nah, in terms of the question I didn't grow up thinking I'm better than everyone. How does that chime with observations about your temperament at the time? Because I think Liam Brady talks about you as having, um, I mean, the description he puts in his own words is that you were notoriously hot-headed mm. and you also got yourself into a situation whilst you were away with Arsenal in a, on a youth tournament in Verona where you got yeah. sent off in a game. How does that temperament um, manifest itself yeah. And how do you look back on it? And do you think that, that there was a challenge that you had to overcome relatively quickly in order to get yourself into a space where you're going to become mm. a serious possible professional footballer? Yeah. Um, and it's hard to look back because I don't think that ever leaves you. Like even now as a coach, right. um, I still have that. And, I, and I'll, I'll reference it with like my players and I speak to them about it a lot. And I'd much rather have someone who's at the the top of the spectrum who's really hot headed hot headed who really cares who really wants to win rather than someone who's not because i think it's harder to give someone that and then it's easier to take that down a little bit and right. you're right i had to i had to learn pretty quickly um, but it went on for years and years because even in the academy um we used to have a sim bin um, what is hot head when, when i mean i i think i know what hot headed means but what does it mean what does it mean to you i think it just means that i would do anything to win Right. And 
then I would get myself into a state where I didn't care if it was Fellaini, for example, pictures of me squaring up to Fellaini. I didn't care how, I just lost right. complete control of who they are, how big they are. I just wanted to win and I would do anything, try anything. Um, and sometimes I'd cross the line. A lot of the times I would I would cross the line. Um, but Liam was, um, even when I got into the first team, Liam was, he was like my, my mentor almost and helping me with them situations. This development of the right mentality, because I've got strong views on academies and you're in the academy now and we'll talk about academies later on and the sort of pivot that you're going through having been an academy player mm -hmm. and now coaching the academy. But how much time and what was the sort of structure put in to helping you finesse that mentality because mm. hot-headedness is one thing desire to win is another sort of irresponsibility is a completely different direction isn't it yeah um you know and this is something i talk about a lot now working in the academy like you said and you know back in when i was coming through we didn't have psychologists we didn't have life coaches we didn't have player care and stuff like that how our mentality was tested was steve bold who's my youth team coach mm certain days you know i remember off the top of my head on a tuesday would be like a hard day and you'd run in the morning and you'd run hard like really run hard you didn't have a gps and the guy saying you know you can only run this much you would run until yeah. you couldn't run anymore right. and then in the afternoon we'd go back out and if one player didn't do it properly they watched back the the training and he didn't do it properly well, let's do it again you're running again mm. and your mind timing would say there is no chance i can run my legs are gone i came out thinking it's gonna be a technical session and we're running again, but guess what? You get through it, yeah. and and then that would then go. Oh my god! Like we, you can actually push your mind to another place and keep going with that. Um, in terms of like helping me with my hot headedness and stuff, it was just conversations with coaches yeah. and coaches' experiences and and having to experience it, go through it. You know, go through the time you speak about in Verona. I was I was fourteen playing up in an under fifteen competition against the best clubs in Europe. Yeah. Liam Brady pulled me before before the final and said, look, just stay on the pitch. You're going to get player of the tournament. Well, 10 minutes in against Inter Milan, someone tripped on my foot and I just went bang, elbowed him, sent off. Um, and that was a big moment for me because, and, and this is what I'm talking about now with academies. Like now, there's so much care. What would that look like? Well, when that happened to me, I walked off the pitch to Liam Brady and he hammered me, yeah. he battered me to the point where I was in tears and walked down the side of the pitch and sat on my own. And that was like, I remember it so much and thinking like that was the learning. That was the moment where. Well, it's gone the other way it's now. Gone, it? Yeah. It's, it's gone the other way. And today, in today's academies, it's gone the other way, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Which do you think is better? I think there's, there has to be a balance. balance yeah. There has to be a balance. I know it's the, the easy thing to say. I would tilt more towards my time. If I wanted, yeah, if I was, I agree. if I was coming through, I'd want it to be the way it was when I was. Cause you've got to put, I mean, you're going into a difficult sport and you're going into a sport to be a man to some extent. So I always used to say when I, I remember walking into palace and listening to the academy director at the time, it might be John Cartwright saying to me, but I think it wasn't. I think it was someone else saying to me, a child's life is like an open book. You write a new page on it every day. And I was like, but that's bollocks. Mm -hmm. Prepare these kids for a very difficult game. Yeah. A lot of them are not going to make it, but also they need to have the characteristics to overcome adversity. They need mm -hmm. to be told the truth. They need to be looked after, but they also need to be prepared for the challenges. And this idea that you, you know, every child's life is like an open book. You write a new page. It's lovely and it sounds really good, but you're not preparing these kids to be men. Mm. You're not preparing, preparing these minnows to be leaders. You're preparing them for failure and, yeah. and the challenges that might overcome them. So it's interesting that you and I think the same way. I mean, yeah. we're different generations, but... Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's really difficult, isn't it? Because the world we live in now and, mm. and you know, with, with mental health, so... yeah so there for or, everyone or people's version and, of it. Yeah, yeah yeah and i think like it is important that we we do speak about that and i think it's important that we the players feel that it's okay to think about that and talk about that um but, but to I, a point yeah to a not, point not you're to, right because, not to use it as an excuse every time no. we have adversity in our lives i don't know what you think to this but every time you have something happen in your life a challenge your a relationship breaks up you have a problem it doesn't mean that you're suffer you have you, no. you you've got a mental health issue it just mm. means you've had something bad happen you've yeah. got to get some adverse you've got to get some backbone to get over yeah. it right yeah no and i i completely agree with that um and the other part is understanding what you're preparing them for yep so that's my thing is how many people 
good point. within academies and there's some really really good people and there's some really intelligent people that want to learn and want to understand football but how many actually understand what you're talking about you know like I might release a player he might have to go into a league two dressing room and what does that look like mm. like I don't even know what that looks like so have we got people who understand what that looks like and we're preparing them for yeah. that um, and that's that's the challenges that, that go on every day in academies how influential or, or visible was Arsene Wenger in perhaps very early in shaping your mentality because you're Mm. you're in and around the first team at a very young age yeah yeah Arsene had like this this aura around him especially with with young players I think because you know the perfect reference for me was Cesc who was right. four years older than me so I was 12 at Hale End trying to find my way and he was 16 playing in the team and Arsene was important for shaping my mentality but also the coaches there they gave me a lot of a lot of help with okay so it was literally right you're 12 you've got four years to get where Cesc is we believe in you how, how are you going to get there and then Arsene obviously is the guy who who ultimately makes that decision you're told as a 12 year old kid that your pathway is ostensibly to emulate Cesc Fabregas mm -hmm. what kind of reaction does that bring out in you at the time inspired me yeah, really inspired me because to have someone like Cesc, and Cesc was eventually my captain, um, but it, it, I don't even think that the coaches would have had to say that to me. Like just Cesc being in the team and seeing Arsene play him in the big games. I remember him playing the Champions League semi final against Juventus. Like, in my opinion, all the kids in the academy should have went, "Oh my god!" But it didn't create a feeling of pressure on you. No, not at no, all. No, it didn't. Not really. No, it didn't. Just, in, just the inspiration. In, yeah, inspired yeah. me. Mm. What's it like? I mean, you get picked at 16 to go into the into the first team. So you're in the first team dressing room now and you're looking around and you've got Carlo Torre, you've got Sessa, as we spoke about, you've got Nasri, you've got William Gallus, Arshavan, Van Persie. This team is four years on from being an invincible and a dominant force in English football. As a 16-year-old, what's that dressing room like? Yeah, do you know, like, and I didn't know this at the time and I've only learned it, as I've grown up, but what, what drives me and what probably always have driven me was fear. Like, so the fear of, it could be something like giving the ball away or letting one of the right. players you're talking about down. Yeah. Um, and that probably held me back a little bit. And, and it's probably hard to think about holding me back because as you said, at 16, I made my debut. But in my opinion, at 16, I could have played week in, week out like Cess did. Um, but that fear, and I, it can be seen, in my opinion, as a good thing and as a bad thing. How you channel it yeah. is a thing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, and as I said, it happened so quick. So I mean, like, it was my first time signing as a scholar. So I've left school, right? I was there before, but not full time. And then I left school, and the first pre seasons out the way. So six weeks later, I've got a place in the in the first team dressing room. Arsene's given me number nineteen, and I'm sat in there with Nasri. Uh, with Gallas, with Sesk, and and there were some difficult characters in there. Like, like Nasri was really good for me. Sesk was really good for me. Bakri Sanya was like a big brother to me and really helped me. And, and a few others I'm probably forgetting. But then you had the William Gallas who was difficult. Robin Van Persie who was difficult in what way? Well, William hammered me a few times as a as a young player, um, like for giving the ball away. So right. one of my biggest things, my biggest fears about you know playing. Um, I remember FA Cup game, West Ham away. Um, I was only 16, 17, and I played on the left wing. Um, and I gave the ball away a few times, and he absolutely battered me. And I remember thinking, oh, like, this is, I'm here now. Like, mm -hmm. this ain't development. This ain't, uh, okay, you might make a few passes. Don't matter if this you lose a game. This is reality. Van Persie just had such high standards. And at that point, I wasn't probably confident enough to to try the things he wanted. Mm -hmm. um, I went on to have a really good relationship with Robin and, and we played well together, especially for one season. But yeah, going in, going in, there was that little bit of fear around probably a little bit, am I good enough to be here? Um, and then keep it simple. Don't, don't do anything to, to piss them off essentially. Um, and yeah, then just build from there. I think this is going to be a difficult question to ask you, but I'm going to frame it in such a way that it doesn't appear to be um, unnecessarily um, antagonistic of the football club. But what I mean, I've asked you what it's like to walk in that dressing room, 
but it looks to me like that's a, like a club is in a little bit of decline. You know, you've gone from the dizzy heights of the Invincibles to a club that was dominating English football, being right on the cusp alongside Man United mm -hmm. for a period of time, of do and now they're not. Mm -hmm. Did you get that sense? Did you get a feeling? I know it's difficult to ask you mm -hmm. when you're 16 years age, you know, about these sort yeah. of things. But did you get a feeling that there's a different feel about this club? There's a different feel of expectation, and mm. it's been. I'm categorizing it as yeah. decline, but I can't not do yeah, that. I when you hit saying. the heights of Invincibles, saying. yeah, it was anything it, it, other than that's a decline. Yeah, it was. It was difficult for me at that time to to listen to that because that was that was, that was going on, right? And I remember my first preseason. I think it was a preseason where Adi Bayor left. It might be my second one, Adi Bayor. I think Colo might have left. And I remember we were in Austria, um, and I'm, I was obviously not part of of, of the conversations in the meeting. But I remember Sesk, I remember Robin, um, might have been Nasri and Galas, like going to Arsene and saying, "Look, what's what's going on? Where are we going with with the club?" Really? Um, yeah. And I think, like looking back, Do you know probably, the response you got. No, I don't. It's huh. probably it probably like looking back done me a favor, really. Right. Like because if we were if they were still invincibles, would I have got a chance? Maybe not. I think as well. Like the the during my whole time, my whole career at Arsenal, there was always that question mark. You know, where's where's the Vieira? Like where's the Thierry? Where's them leaders? Where's the Tony Adams? Like and especially when when we started to like threaten to drop out the top four, um, them questions were always there, and and probably. Rightly so, in my opinion. Like we probably could have done with a Vieira, someone to like grab us in them tough moments and and help us through it. Um, don't get me wrong, we had some leaders leaders in the group, but like a real like leader. Sesk, I've always referenced Sesk, and I know Sesk left after my first year, but uh, my first proper year playing. So he left when I was nineteen, and that's one of my biggest regrets is not is not playing with him. But he he would lead he was not afraid to hold people accountable he would stick it on people and challenge them probably in the wrong way towards the end or just before he left to to barca um because he was frustrated he just wanted to leave mm -hmm. um frustrated with what i think frustrated with what you're saying the the, the fact that the fact that they weren't at the top of yeah the... we're not challenging yeah. anymore probably didn't look like challenging it was sort of a a period of of change with the new stadium um and he was just frustrated you break in in 2008 and you're 16 and then there's a period where you know you're you're not playing in the first team and really you break through in 2010 don't you 2011 yes. um and during that course of that season there's this particular game where you really come to the fore i mean you play i think mean, you play 49 games in that season mm -hmm. you know you you're beginning to establish yourself now as a as a first team player and part of the of the framework of Arsenal and the fabric and a lot of noise gets made about you but then a really a load of noise gets made about you after the game against Barcelona um where you know I think you're just lauded and applauded left right and center mm. did you see that as the beginning of something for you did you look at that and go that's a stand up moment and i suppose where does that sort of performance come from? Is it just a performance that's waiting to happen? Mm. Because it's a, it's a performance that's that's sort of held in high regard and seen as something that's the beginning of the next great British hope. Here he is, bang, he's mm. landed at Arsenal. He's just dominated a game, changed the direction of it and being the best player on a country mile and people like Pep Guardiola are waxing lyrical about him. Mm. Yeah, um, I think the reason that people talk about that game so much is is probably because Barca were the best team in the world mm -hmm. at that point, right? And uh, like, there's there's always a few games in my career that stand out that I felt like that and I felt like I played like that. And, and players would always say, you know, some games things just click and, and you, you try things and they ha and they work. Um, so I didn't really feel like that. I remember actually Nasri saying to me after the game, exactly what you're saying, right? Come on in now, you've you've gone to the next level. I remember in, if I was standing in the tunnel and thinking, oh my God, like there's Messi, there's Iniesta, there's Xavi, there's Busquets. Like people, not that I'd grown up watching, I'd watched the year before trying to emulate them. Um, and then I remember the game starting and, and actually I didn't start the game well. We didn't start the game well as a team. But then I remember there was like a moment in the game where I made a tackle. I think I, at the time I didn't even know it was Messi. I took the ball off Messi and I popped past um, Iniesta. And I remember like, passing it and hearing the crowd like lift mm. and then like looking and thinking why are they going mad and because it was messy and Iniesta, right. and then i just built on my confidence and yeah the, the game went on and but even like i watch it back now simon and i think i could have done things better in that right. game and 
but no one talks about the second leg either. We lost the second leg. Right. And we went out of the competition, which which still to this day, like Nicholas Bentner had a had a chance in the last minute and it still haunts me now. Right. Um but it was a good night and and uh, one that I look back on now and like even my kids, you know, I've got a twelve year old son and he's like, Oh, you play against Messi and You get injured. Um uh, later on in that year, in 2011, which takes you out of commission for a period of time. You come back from that injury and quite a significant amount of that playing squad has been moved on. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's Cess or Robin Van Persie or it's uh, uh, um, uh, Nasri. Does that, when you're coming back in, does that feel like, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in Arsenal in this part of the conversation. Does that feel like Arsenal... A uh, club that's changing direction is not on its way up, is either maintaining or in part potentially going backwards. Well, the truth is, it was a completely different team. Like you said, like Cazorla had come in, um, Mikel had come in. He was a good player, by the way, Santa Cazorla. Oh, he was unbelievable. So while we were losing big personalities, big players for the team, we also replaced them and. I, I felt a weird sense of, of like leadership there as well. Like I was still only 20, 19, 21. 20, yeah. 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 yeah like I, at the time, I didn't think, oh, my God, like Sesk's leaving, Robin's leaving, probably because I was injured and I wanted just, just to get back. Um, but when I look back on that for, at the end of my career, it probably was like maybe we were, we were maintaining. We were still had, had quality players, but were we competing for the league? Probably not. Um, where were the leaders? I mean, if you're taking Cesc Fabregas out and you're taking Robin Van Persie out, whether that's by example or by stature, you're kind of taking some of the leadership out mm. of it. And you mentioned earlier on about we could probably could have done a little bit more of that. Where are the leaders at that time? Who are the leaders? So and Mikel would come in. Like? Mikel, um, you could tell straight away when, when Mikel came in, he was, he, he was a leader. He was a little bit different. We we also brought in Podolski, who was a big right. personality, um, and and the truth is we probably lost a little bit of of leadership. I, as I said, I felt a, a responsibility to be a leader. I felt I think that's what it did as well. Actually, remember like when um, when we signed all the English players and it was like the English core and yeah. this is going to be the future of Arsenal. What that did right. for that group was probably go right, come on in. This is this is um, this is your time. You have to stand up and be a right. leader. Um, we fell short in 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 moments. What what does leadership when you, when you talk about leadership? What does leadership mean to you? When you when you're using leadership as an example, what does it represent? I, I think I understand what leadership means, mm. but I'm more interested in what you think it is. Yeah, I didn't know at that point, and and probably um, I thought I had an understanding and and thrown into it, and it was you know like was Gallus giving you a bollock in leadership? No, I didn't think so. No. I don't think so. I think he would have definitely said yes. Like if you ask him now, like he wouldn't have done it just to dig me out or make me feel a certain type of way. But I felt like that's probably that generation as well, right? And you could get away with that more um, back then, and, and players would respond to that more. Um, what did leadership mean to me as as a player? It was it was it was it was standing up and and being there, and you know like that. I don't even now like, and and I see academy football a lot, and I don't see that enough in academies. But even like in the Premier League, like like similar to what you mm. said, when when things go tough, get tough, and you have to go through moments, like it doesn't always mean that that you're going through a bad time or or things are difficult. Yes, there might be, but also sometimes you just gotta stand up and face it, like that adversity, that um, them tough times where, and it was it was it was harder at that point. At, at Arsenal because we'd lost leaders because then they referenced back to Vieira to the mm. Invincibles to Tony Adams um, and I think like the best form of leadership for them guys was was turning up yes holding people accountable as well when they fall below certain standards um, but actually just just turning up and when when times are hard being that guy being the face of it and and, and trying to lead by example really you mentioned Mikel, um, and you mentioned the fact that you know you pretty much tell straight away that when he came in, he was a leader, and he was your captain for a bit, wasn't mm -hmm. he? 
what kind of what was he like as a player to play alongside? Um, he was a good player. He technically very very good. Um, understanding of the game very good. Leading, talking. He he was kind of different to to anything I'd experienced at that point when when he came in. I remember when he came in, um, I was injured. I had uh, one of them boots on, and it was his first day. And I remember, <laughs> I remember him just saying to me. Oh, uh, how long are you out for, Jack? And it was literally like that. And I was like, uh, six weeks, whatever it was. And he was like, okay, well, you need to hurry up. You need to get back. And like as as little as that might sound, he probably understood that I was a good player and he wanted me back in the team. And no one ever done that really. Um, then he led by example. He was always on time. All the the, the things you expect from from someone like Mikel and being a leader and and obviously gone on to do what he's doing. I look at Arteta now. I don't always concur with some of the things he says, and no one ever does concur with everything, and he's probably he's not going to be slightly to be bothered whether I concur with it or not. But he seems to be a very empathetic, very arms around the shoulder, protect everybody at all costs. Was he like that as a player? Was he was he a was he a encourager? Was he a bollocker? Was he an arms around the shoulder sort of person? I mean, he seems to have related to you pretty quickly about getting back in the side and showing yeah. you some attention and pay some interest in you. But when you look back on him and think. Well, what was he? Was he was he the things I'm describing? Which yeah. one of them was he? I think he was a little bit of both. It, the number one thing that, that I think about with him is that arm around. He'd be that guy, um, you know, that sort of Spanish Mediterranean. They're, they're very touchy feely. Yeah. Come here, give me a cuddle. Yeah. yeah. But also, I remember him him having having um, discussions, heated discussions with other team members, with yeah, with players. Um, so he he he. he he can also, and he and he does as a coach. Right, we've seen it with with Aubameyang and and, and the all yeah. or nothing stuff. He can also yeah. be Not that guy, yeah. and he understands that. Yeah. Um, but I think his, one of his biggest traits that I like about him is, it's I I I, I hear him pathetic, but it's also I think he's got a lot of humility, and that's not easy an easy thing to have. I don't think as a as a Premier did he League challenge coach. managers? Yes, he did. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In in what respect? In terms of individual moments, mm, philosophies, yeah. um, in more individual moments and and processes. So, um, I think back to that sort of um, transition period at Arsenal, where we'd gone from invincibles to still challenging to yeah. then not really challenging, and just a, a few things we used to do, and like in terms of what we did in training, did we train? Um, do we do the right thing before a game in terms of the game uh, plan? Um, do we do enough analysis? I always remember him being forefront and, and the guy who would sort of represent the team in that sense. Wenger talks about, Wenger at that time, talked about top four being a trophy, which is a big departure mm. from the previous Arsenal achievements. Did you, as players... Did you believe that getting into the top four was a trophy? Yeah, being honest, I, mean, I think we knew that. We knew that was our level. Our level, really, yeah. Like City had just come. They're spending all this money. They would Nick Nasri. They'd taken Adebayor. Um, United were still there with their Rooney, Vidic, Rio. They weren't going anywhere. Um, and we we probably knew that that we we would fall short if we if we really really. We're honest with ourselves, um, so like I don't remember any conversations that between players where we're going. Well, why is what why is the gaffer now? saying that? Like, I don't remember that, and I remember also celebrating finishing the top four like as a success. Um, and it's probably difficult for fans, and I understand that because of because of the invincibles, because of how successful. But for Arsenal you guys, was. is that a winning mentality? I mean, you you, you know. You've got a background with people like Gallus that want to win and bollock people, and it's not necessarily the right way to go. You've got Van Persie, who mm. Wenger's let go to our, uh, to Man United. Were you surprised by that, by the way? Yes. Yeah, a little bit. Um, disappointed by it? Yeah, a little bit disappointed, but also, again, being really honest, like thinking that's probably the the pathway that we were on. So we'd lost Nasri, we'd lost Adibayor, We'd lost Sesk. Robin stayed for an extra year, had an unbelievable year. I think he scored 30 goals. And and I think he just knew and we knew that we weren't going to challenge. In the next few years, we weren't going to challenge. 
Um, we've obviously got a new stadium and, and all the pressures that brings. Because um, the fan reaction to it was quite extreme, wasn't it? I mean, a fan reaction to a, for Arsenal, because you don't see it happen very often, do you? You no. don't see one of your major competitors take arguably one of your best players. Mm. And the reaction, if my recollection is correct, was quite visceral from the yeah. fan base. Yeah, I uh, think I think rightly you, so, you, no? Do you mean? I think that's understandable. But you as players, it's not Yeah. It's not a mentality I would have thought that you would have yeah. enjoyed. No, no and, and it was disappointing and it and it hurt and there was definitely conversations between players that like what's going on and and but one thing Arsene was was good at as well and I don't I don't know if it was that year or a little bit later but he 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 went and got Ozil and then all of a sudden we're going well he, we still we're still wanting to challenge right. then if we're going to bring these players in Alexi Sanchez came maybe the year later Santi came who was like as you said what a player mm. um, so yeah we lost I think it was it was a little bit more more hurtful like personally as players because we had a relationship with Robin that's probably the honest truth where you know we'd built some in and and he was a captain he was a good leader in my opinion he, he set standards high and 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 very um to the point and he would say it say it to your face which I liked um and then for him to leave and go to someone someone like United and mm. and, and and again so I'm probably being honest because he's United. basically saying, I can't get what I want here. I'm a winner. I want to yeah. win things. Mm. So I'm going to leave with respect. I'm going to leave those that are happy losing behind. Yeah. Yeah, and no, I'm no. going to go where somewhere where I can win. Yeah. And I just wonder what that reaction is. Because he's leaving Arsenal because you ain't good enough. Yeah. And you ain't going to challenge. Mm. And all mm. you guys that are being told you're the future of English football, you're playing in a side that's quite happy to be finishing fourth. Yeah. yeah. And the truth is as well, um, as much as it hurt, we probably knew that we couldn't we couldn't challenge anyway. He was going to challenge and as much as it hurt, as much as we hated it and as much as it hurt the fans, they went on to win the league the next year, mm. Robin. So um He made the right choice for him. Yeah. Talk to me about injuries and you I mean, you have this fantastic season in two thousand and ten, two thousand eleven. You play forty nine times, you have this game that we've discussed where everyone starts waxing lyrical about you, and then you get injured. And it's not a, it's not a small injury. It's a significant one which keeps you out for a year. Mm -hmm. For you as a player, I mean, you're still very young, but notwithstanding it, you're sitting on the sidelines. Things have been written about you, and and opportunities are awaiting you. And here you are now with a significant injury. What what's that period like from both a physical rebuild and a mental approach yeah. to it? Yeah, um, physical rebuild was was tough and. Um, because I'd played from such a young age, because I'd never had any injuries growing up through the academy, I just play football. So yeah. and then all of a sudden, you're injured, and you've got uh, you still got to go into training. You got to do something. So that you do gym, you do rehab, rightly so. Um, and I was so weak in terms of things I didn't even know that I needed, and it didn't really really affect me as as a player, but. It took a long time to rebuild myself. Um, from a mental point of view, probably at that point, I didn't realise how much damage it had done. And, In what way? Well, if you like, so after that injury, so that first season, 10 11, I was never the same player. I, I then played every single day with physically. pain physically. Right. But what uh, about mentally? Uh, mentally, I was, I, was, I was still there and probably maybe a little bit uh, stronger and and grateful and all these words that come to mind because I'd had such an... And it was a bad injury. It was yeah. a career-threatening injury where they hadn't really seen it before. They had to get two surgeons in and, and I went from this kid just playing football and loving it every day and, you know, yeah, playing in the Champions League, no fear, just let's go. Um, and then all of a sudden it's taken away from you and... You know, I'm sat in front of two doctors, and they're saying, "Well, yeah, you might, you might never play again." Um, but yeah, do you think you play too much? Do you think in that first, in that, I mean, okay, you're mm. what, 18, 19 mm. that season, you play forty nine games. Mm. Do you think? Yeah, probably. But, do you? Yeah, but also, Simon, like I remember, this was sort of the first year where the GPS came in, and okay, people were saying, "Yeah, they understand it," and but they didn't really, and they speak about this red zone. If the player's in the red zone, he's in danger. And I remember having conversations with, with medical staff and they're going, well, you know, you might need to 
take your foot off the gas a little bit. I'm going, what? I'm, I'm 18, 19. I'm playing week in, week out yeah, in the Premier League. Football, yeah. and that's not happening. Do you not think there's a little bit of responsibility on maybe Arson and the club to go, mm, young player, the manner in which he plays, we're inviting trouble here? I think it's hard for, for Arson that. And because, number one, if he had come to me and said, um, which he wouldn't have because I was playing well and I knew that he, he'd have wanted me to play. Um, if he'd have come to me and said, what do you think about missing this? No, You'd have said no, no right? You yeah. said play. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but that's your youth. Yeah. And his is the, and theirs is to be the guiding light to look yeah. at it because short-term gain against long-term loss. Yeah, yeah. You get an instantaneous performance, but then all of a sudden a player gets put in a way of an injury mm. and you've lost him for a year. Yeah, but it's also like, let's say April or March. March, April that season, I might have been tired, looking tired, but they couldn't have said, oh, you're going to get an ankle injury or this is going to happen. No, it was just enough. a risk yeah. a little bit. And I've got to be careful with that because it frustrates a life out of me now with, with like GPS and everything and like... Um, it's going too far the other get, way. Yeah, like, yeah. We, like there has to be... We have to push players. Mm. And like, I grew up with listening to Beckham, Lampard, Gerrard, talking about, you know... Um, it wasn't really the training that made me a player. It was after I went and got 10 balls or yeah, I went and, and just kept on spent 20 minutes and practice, practice, practice. And we have to be careful not to lose that. Absolutely. Mm. Do you think there's young players these days, because a lot of arguments are being made about Saka and the amount of games that he's playing and other young players and this feeling that they need to be playing in every single game because they can have an impact. Do you think that young players are being played a little bit too much at the moment? I don't, but no, I'm more I don't. interested in what think, you think. I think they get the balance right especially with someone like Bakayu and all these players where like what what people don't see is he might be managed in the week or he might yeah. miss this day or he might not do everything in a training session. And, um, you know, it was actually Eddie Howe who, who showed me that that can work. It was when I went to, Bournemouth. yeah, when yeah. I went to Bournemouth, like I needed to, to get away from Arsenal. I weren't playing. I kept getting injuries and then to go into this new environment and be managed by someone who, who understood that I, I've got a lot of quality but I need to be managed right in the week. Um, and he, he like, well, like I said, when I left West uh, Arsenal, I was probably done. He was probably the one who, who prolonged my career in that sense because I right. knew that, you know, I didn't have to train on a Wednesday, for example. I could just miss that day and I'd be all right for the weekend. And that was thanks to him. Observations are made about you that the style of play, the manner, in, the manner in which you held on to the ball, invited challenges, pivoted and rolled away. It's a bit like watching, to some extent, different positions I know where you watch Jack Grealish and you watch uh, Saka and they get a lot of challenges, they, 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 they have the ball, so they're inviting people to tackle them. Do you think that two things, that you could have pivoted and changed the game, and do you think now, if you're playing now, that given the way football's evolved, where almost tackling is almost outlawed, yeah. that you might have had a better opportunity not to sustain so many injuries? I think the, the first answer is I could have. I could have changed the way I played, but then um, would I have been the same player? Would would people have respected me for for being that little bit different as an English player? Um, you know, because one of my biggest frustrations is now if, as a midfielder, you see so many midfielders get the ball, pass sideways, get the ball, pass back, and then at the end of the game they go, "Well, look, he's got ninety eight percent pass completion." Yeah. Um, and that just breaks me all the time because I see so many moments where I think, well, midfielder can turn and drive. Um, and that was my game. So I, I, I probably wouldn't have enjoyed football the way I did. My, part of that is probably when I, when I spoke about the start, like that winning, I just wanted to win and I wanted to do everything I could. And if it was my direct opponent, if it was an 80-20 for him, I'm going into it. Or if I've overrun it and I know that he's going to smash me, but I can nick it away from him. I'd still go for it. So, so there's a trade-off for you. Yeah. The trade-off is is your perception is if you had modified your game in the interest of prolonging your career, you would have not been the player that you were for the period yeah. of time that you were. Mm -hmm. no, I think so. What uh, about the observation of playing in today's game? Yeah. So I've, I've thought about that a lot recently because um, being at Arsenal and and learning about Mikel's playing style and, you know, trying to align the under-18s with it. Um, like I would have loved to have played in, in the way Mikel sees the game, Pep sees the game. Um, 
you know, like the positional game because the idea of the positional game is to position yourself between people so you actually never really get in contact. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I love that side of the game, Simon. So, mean, like growing up, being in midfield, like winning the battle, like watching players like Roy Keane, Steven Gerrard, like dominating, not just in possession, like out possession, really getting stuck in. And I love that part of the game. So, I mean, I was just thinking, what would I prefer to play now or play when I did? Probably when I did, with a different style. Right. You talked about, it's a controversial one for you, you're not going to like. Um, you talked about Wenger saying to you about some of the things that you did were unacceptable. And I'm going to ask you a question about your lifestyle outside of the game and whether, whether certain activities and certain behaviours off the pitch, whether it's getting nicked for a fight outside a nightclub or smoking cigarettes or, you know, that sort of activity. Do you think that's a, that helped you in your general well-being as a footballer? Did it hold you back from being A, at the top of your game and detract from things? Because I talk mm. to you now. I mean, I remember sitting there. I'm going to be honest with you. I remember sitting there watching you on that balcony thinking, you're fucking Herbert. What are you doing singing that chant for? And I look at you now and I speak to you now. Well, we're all older and we're wiser. And I don't get that sense from yeah. you. I don't get that cocky sort yeah. of flash. Yeah. Sort of what you're on about. Sort of attitude. Yeah, no, I was, I was really good at, at separating that, Simon. So I was, honestly, and I never like saying it myself, but I was so dedicated. Like from the age of nine, like, changing making sacrifices and and listen i loved it and i didn't feel like a sacrifice at the time um and then all of a sudden i got into the first team got a little bit of money um you know london nightlife growing up like going out in london was never a thing like my mum and dad didn't do it didn't think about it and then all of a sudden you know i've got sammy nasri as my mate lives in london going to stay at his we might pop out to a nice restaurant um, and my life did change but i was still very good at separating if I was going to go out and I was going to go out and I was going to do it properly, I was going to yeah. uh, But the smoking fags and shish and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, so the smoking oh. fags thing, like Arsene, like he was brilliant. He, I remember like actually really shitting myself for the first time with Arsene when, when that happened. I was in on the back page of a fag thinking, oh my God, what's Arsene going to think? Like, what's he going to say? What's he going to think? And he was unbelievable. He was like, yeah, just make sure that... When you're here, you're focused. You know, he, says, he actually said, you know, when I was a young player, I used to like sometimes to have a fag, and I was like, oh my god, like this is just what I needed to hear. Um, but yeah, like, I don't know. I, I just feel like I was really good at What would really you say to young player now? Get away from that. Don't be involved in that stuff. Don't allow that representation of yourself. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, in hindsight, yeah. I'm but, not judging you. I'm asking you because yeah, it's, no, it's part no, and parcel of things just, you've done. Yeah, I'm just trying to think like because. I actually I was so good at, at separating it and 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 also separating. So when I had a fight, when I was arrested, and obviously I got then let out on bail. But I was I was really good at going. Okay, that's going on in my life, but football is is where it's at and what I want to do. The singing on the on the balcony. Um, I actually grew twice. Up, yeah. So my mum was an Arsenal fan. Yeah. But all her family was Tottenham fans. Right. So I grew up with constant back and forth like banner. Um, but that I remember just thinking like this is a moment that I've been waiting for my whole life. Like my uncle, biggest Tottenham fan in the world, um, and I was just going to give him a little bit. And yeah, of course I regret that mm. um, because because as you said, I look like a what was the word you use? Herbert. Herbert. <laughs> I look like a Herbert. <laughs> Mate, I've looked at I've looked like a Herbert a thousand times. Now, so. <laughs> You know, there it goes by the, by the grace of God, go us all. You leave, you leave Arsenal at 26, and you go to West Ham. Right, your career, at Arsenal, two FA Cups. Yeah, yeah, series of top fours, yep. playing for arguably one of the greatest managers the English football seen. Was it a wrench to leave Arsenal? Was it? I mean, <laughs> the situation is that you play 38 games in your last season, and if I'm right. Wenger tells you there's a possibility you're not going to get a new contract. That no. was at the beginning of the season. Beginning of the season, yeah. But you play 38 that game season, and your mindset is, I'll prove him wrong. Mm -hmm. right? Are you disappointed that you're told by Wenger, someone that's been telling everyone how wonderful you are previously, that you're not going to get a new contract? No, because I appreciated his honesty at that point. Um, I'd just come back from Bournemouth. I'd broke my leg at White Hart Lane, yeah. believe it or not, which went down not so great. Um, and then... I'd done re I got married that summer. I had a really good summer. I come back doing my rehab. 
Um, and I sat in the, in the gym on the bike, thinking, literally thinking, what am I doing? Like, what's going on? Um, okay, I need to get fit. But even then, what's happening? And Arsene just appeared, didn't even have a meeting, just appeared and came out of nowhere and said, look, almost a little bit like, just to let you know, give you the heads up, the club aren't offering you, mm. aren't going to offer you a, a, a deal. So if you can find a long-term deal somewhere. Where you go. Yeah, yeah. where you go. You appreciate his honesty, did, but you didn't appear to appreciate Unai Emery's. Yeah. Because he's going to give you a contract, yet he tells you, and this is my, this is my research telling me this, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, he's going to give you a contract, but he's not going to give you a guarantee that you're going to be in the first team. And that you have a turn about that. Mm. Actually, Why? I did appreciate his honesty because, so how it went was, um, they, I then, as you say, got back into the team, had a really good, good season, um, and then they offered me a new deal. Now that deal was heavily based around appearances. Right. And but you back yourself, don't you? I did with Arson. So the difference was right. by this point, Arson had told us as a group he's leaving. Um, then they offered me a deal. Well, this deal is only a good deal a if, play, yeah. if you play yeah. and I don't know who the manager is going to be. Right. So I waited. Um, and he's told you he doesn't want you. In the, not so I waited and he arrived day one um, and I had a meeting with him and I appreciated his honesty. Mm. He actually said, uh, I have to go somewhere where I'm relevant. And I think it was a little bit lost in, in translation, okay. but All right. it was it was a clear message. Um, and was it hard to leave? No, because of that. Because of that. Don't get me wrong. All the... The, my history and my my past with the club meant the world to me, and it still does. But you know, when there's a manager saying, "No, you're not going to play," so you, mm -hmm. you you have to leave. That pretty clear that it was the right moment to go. Even though they're offering you a contract. I mean, listen. Now I look back, and I should have signed a contract. But mm -hmm. at that point, it just felt right. Um, time for a change. Time for a change. Arsene was leaving. Gone, the yeah. club was going yeah. in a different direction. A manager who who didn't know me who I, I, I hadn't earned his trust and potentially I could have earned his trust, but he's also going to want to bring in different players, different midfielders. And, and he did. When you leave Arsenal and you go to West Ham, I'm not going to be overly um, derisory, but your career is winding down. I think we covered this at the beginning where you accept now with a benefit of hindsight, not at the time, but at 26 years of age, it would appear now that your best days sadly are behind mm -hmm. you. And that really, it's like a death of a thousand cuts the next four years, isn't yeah. it? It's rather than the lights going out for you, mm -hmm. it's like the dimmer from hell. It's getting turned down yeah. inch by inch, yard by yard. What's that like? I mean, to some people, the the the, the acceptance of the lights are off is challenging. So at the time, obviously, when I went to West Ham and signed a three year deal, I didn't think um, I'm past it. I just had a really good season with Arsenal. Yeah. You know, played in the Europa League semi final. I think it was like had a good season, and you know I wanted to uh, to go and and challenge myself still in the Premier League. I had a few different options. I chose West Ham. Obviously, I grew up a West Ham fan, yeah, which was, was probably part of, part of the reason, and probably a little bit naive from me as well, where I'd been at Arsenal and 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 still when I was at Arsenal at that point, it was 65, 75 percent of the time you had the ball. Yeah. So you didn't have to run as much. You didn't have to put yourself into challenges as much. And then when I went to West Ham, it was the opposite. Twenty percent of the time we're over the ball, and then the other part of the game you got to really pay attention to, especially when you're playing against the big teams. Um, and I probably struggled a little bit with that. What didn't help me, what didn't help Pellegrini, was the first four games of that season we lost. Um, and then I got were you in that side that got hide, got hiding at Anfield. Yes, the yeah. first game of the season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then first four games we lost and then I got injured, my ankle again, and the next game the team won. So all of a sudden I'm in a position where I've yeah. come into a new club, I'm, I'm his signing, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm earning decent money for this club and now I'm not fit and the club are going on to win games. And um, yeah, that was difficult. And um, as I said at the start, like, I didn't have that support system at West Ham. You know, it was West Ham is a, a club where you turn up, roll your socks up, and you're going. Right, and 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 they've had success from that, and I think that's why David Moyes has been so successful mm. because he's really good at that. Um, and I struggled with that a little bit. When you decide to pack him, right? You obviously West Ham, Bournemouth. You go you go over to to to, to Denmark for a bit, don't you? Mm -hmm. And you've you've decided that's it, right? And you've made that decision. Were you at peace with that? Did you, you know, I'm 30 years of age. You're 30 years of age. You're mm. still a very young mm. man. 
Were you at peace with that decision? Um, I was, yeah. I was, but... Do you know what? It happened so quick, Simon. So I was without a club, which kind of gives you a, a clue. A, a clue. Yeah. Um, went to Bournemouth. They were in the championship. Um, played a few games, and Jonathan Woodgate came in, didn't play. Again, sort of gives you a clue. Mm. They didn't offer me a new deal again. Then I had another six months where I was without a club. That's when I went back to, to Arsenal. I was on my A licence at that right. point, and I was trying to stay fit to find a club. And I, I had had a few doubts then. Um but also, I was I was training with the first team and and doing okay, and I was thinking, well, you know, I could still still play. Um, where that will be, I don't know. Got a call from Roy Hodgson about uh, this club in Denmark. Okay. Um, he'd put a coach that he'd worked with from Crystal Palace, a guy called Dave Reddington. I know Dave. Yeah. Yeah. Top yeah. guy. Top guy. Uh, good coach as well. And he 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 goes, I want to have a conversation with you as an assistant coach there. Spoke to Dave, and straight away I thought, right, I'm going. Don't know why. I'd never played abroad in my life. Had the option to go to Turkey. Had the option to go to Italy. Had two young kids with with someone who I wasn't with, so that made that a little bit difficult. But at this point, I thought, well, I'm going to go. Um, it's a bit strange. No one really goes to Denmark, but I'm going to go out there. I'm going to play. I'm going to enjoy it. Um, and I did. I went over there. Had a great time. Um, in the back of my mind was always sort of that coaching right. pathway. When do I start it? If I want to be a coach, you know, some of these coaches that I'll be competing against, they started when they were 20. Like, they've got all these years of experience. When am I going to start doing that? Um, and then finished the season at, in Denmark. It went okay. Like, didn't set the world alight. The, 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 the standard was okay, but uh, in a standard where I should have been better than I, I was probably. Um, and I came back. And they actually offered me another year, had a few other conversations with clubs. But I just thought, Simon, like, uh, I've got four kids. Am I going to go to Cyprus? Am I going to go to Turkey? Am I going to go back to Denmark? Um, or do I start my coaching? And at that point, I didn't know. And I had a phone call from Per. I was on the golf course, um, summer 22, saying, look, this role's come up. The club, are you uh, interested? Yeah. yeah, are you interested? Because you're now into, uh, you're now into, because you, you're in reinvention mode now. This is a new phase of yeah. your life, isn't it? You're 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 out of football as a player. You're economically, I sus I should imagine, okay, because you'd have done all well. Mm -hmm. So you're, you know, without being too crass, you're probably a millionaire coming out of football, maybe a multi-millionaire coming out of football. But you're at a crossroads now, aren't you? Because you're only thirty. And you've now got to reinvent yourself. I've yeah. been down that pathway myself, you know, from being a Premier League football club owner to someone that wiped out a hundred million pound fortune and having to rebuild and relook at things and reevaluate things mm. and find out what it is that I now think is success. Yeah. And you're in that space to some extent. So this is a challenging period for you, isn't it? Because you've now gone into coaching. What kind of coach are you? I'm a I'm a coach. I'd like to think who cares, especially at 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 this point of where I am. So in terms of the journey of the players that I'm coaching now, I really understand their journey, and and I would like to think I understand their 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 thought process of where they're at. Um, Are you technically a good coach? That that's what I'd like to say. I am. Yeah, I'd like to think so. Like where, and I need to get better. But yeah. I've, I've seen progress. You're you know, I went, too, aren't you? don't get me wrong. I'm 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 here on a journey that I want to get to there. So there's still loads and loads to do, um, and also understanding sort of the the playing style and my playing style. Mm -hmm. I think the more you understand that, then you can start going. Oh, I'm a technical coach because I know what each phase requires. Um, but I do love it. I do love okay. that side. What of kind it. of coach is Arteta? Cool. You know, Mikel like he's so intense, and again, he cares so much and. He he's on the grass. He is active. He's taking sessions. He's stopping it and coaching. That's that's one thing like that impressed me so much with Mikel when I went in. So I, we obviously I had Arsenal the majority of my career. Yeah, Eddie was a little bit different. Um, Roy Hodgson was a bit different. But I, I saw Mikel like almost. I'd never experienced coaching like that since the academy. You know, like stop. Mm. Like what do you see and what are the solutions and like really breaking down the game. Um, and he's the best at that, in my opinion, the best at stopping it and seeing and helping the players find solutions. Do you think Arteta, and, and try not to give me the, the company answer, <laughs> do you think Arteta will lead Arsenal to the to the promised land? Do you think he'll What's win the, the Premier League? Premier League? Mm, absolutely. 
I think he can. Yeah. Do you think he will? Yes, eventually. Whether that's this season, whether that's next season, whenever that is, I think the steps that they've made. Um, and and the thing is that whenever I see Mikel, that like he's getting more and more intense and more and more passionate and more and more. Um, Inten- by intense, you mean focus. Right? Focus, yeah. yeah just not so intense focused. in terms of overbearing and making no, people no, uncomfortable, no. but focus, no, zeroed yeah. in, single minded, right? He's focused and yeah. like the Abamian thing, he understood that and that's probably the best thing for the team and he's going to go he with it. He was right, wasn't he? Yeah, he was he right. Was um, like, because everyone was going, well, no one's going to catch City, no one's going to catch Liverpool. Now, all of a sudden, we're in the conversation mm. um, and we're getting stronger, in my opinion. And, and yes, there's some, some hurdles that teams will have to face and I'm sure we'll have to face them at some point. Um, but like we did last year, we lost a few players with injury and, and suffered it. a little bit. Suffered, bottled it. Suffered because City bottled it. Okay, City lose Diaz, then in comes Kanji. So yeah, but notwithstanding that, you had games that you could have won and should have won, and yeah. there were games that were in your jurisdiction. And teams like Southampton and West Ham at that time shouldn't have been giving you the trouble that they did. Mm, but I think, but you're better now. I think. Yeah, but bottled it would be. If we'd won it the previous year or the year before, or we'd no, been around it, it. Would be you were six, eight points clear in your own hands and swallowed it. Yeah, but without any reference or experience of winning that before. Right. I wouldn't say we bottled it. Is your is your ambition? Is it your direction of travel that you're going to be a first team manager? That's that's my my vision. That's what I want. Um, but I also understand how tough. How long potentially the journey could be. Yeah. Um, and then I, like, I don't. I'm not going to go and jump into the first team when I'm not ready. Like, no, but it's your ambition. Yeah. That's what you're building yeah. towards. It doesn't mean that you're not going to do your job properly here and earn your stripes and learn your trade. No. But your overriding ambition mm. now, the next phase of the Jack Wilshire story, is I would like to be, I would like to do at some point what Mikel Arteta is doing. Yes. Good luck. Thank you. Listen, thank you for coming in. It's been lovely to see you. Thank you, Simon. Thanks for being so upfront. Thank you. Upfront with me, Simon Jordan, is brought to you by William Hill. For new weekly shows, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can find audio episodes on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. 18 plus, please gamble responsibly.